morning everybody for this morning session on trauma i'll invite first dr manish nagpal for his keynote lecture on relevance of timing the vision restoration surgery in trauma thank you vishal a very good morning to all of you i'll be talking to you some relevance related to the timing uh, trauma um, i think the first thing we need to always know is whether it's a closed globe or an open globe injury and based on that a lot of uh, factors come into the picture to manage these so if you have a blunt trauma you could have a berlin stema you could have coronary tear but um, essentially these are more where you need to diagnose and um, see for any other aspects that need an active treatment you may have a dialysis you may have a tear which may require an early intervention in those situations or some sort of a damage which happens with due force related to the Berlin's uh, edema that you may have tears forming on the posterior core, the macular hold at times. And at times you may just see uh, extensive choroidal folds uh, post trauma uh, where you probably don't have to do really anything except wait for the inflammation to settle and uh, come around. At times the patient comes to you with uh, almost no PL and you might see an aversion of the uh, you may see that in the eye or you may sometimes have to depend on an MRI to uh, diagnose that. And at times you may have a lens which goes uh, behind. But if there is an open globe, then of course primary repair is a must. You have to remove uh, any debris or disorganized tissue, repair the wound, restore the anatomy as much as possible and reposition the tissues uh, from the outside as a primary repair. Uh, this is usually done within 24 hours, 48 hours, so that the edema, uh, the, all the repercussions of an immediate trauma don't uh, set in. Before that, you need to go and repair so that the infection doesn't come in. Uh, vitrectomy as a primary repair is taken in specific situations if there is an intraocular foreign body or endophthalmitis. Otherwise, that is usually done as a secondary repair. So if you see, suspect the foreign body, uh, you need to go in and, and remove the foreign body. So typical situation like that, uh, you see a, a, a foreign body is gone in and the penetrating the site of impact is seen uh, on one side of the disc and then of course you free the foreign body from any entanglements which are there and then typically enlarge the first venous and then remove it. Inferiorly there was an, also a site where the foreign body had impacted so uh, after initially impacting, it usually gravitates down. So we need to look at the whole periphery and make sure that the areas are well treated. And then, of course, uh, endophthalmitis is the other uh, concern uh, where you need to go in early in these cases. The case by my colleague, Dr. Namit, uh, who also was dealing with an IOFP, but within a day it developed uh, by the time patient was posted the next day, I had endophthalmitis sitting in. So. Uh, these kind of situations come in with or without foreign body and you can see that in this situation again uh, this infection which has come in so you need to clear up everything uh, remove the foreign body uh, in the situation and luckily the patient responded well uh, and, and got back his living good vision so in these situations a vitrectomy is required early uh, you could also have a situation with the lens being involved fully and then when you go in, there's a foreign body and when you clear up, uh, you see an impacted foreign body near the disc, which has led to a branch retinal artery occlusion uh, in this situation. So, of course, we do the PVD creation, the blood has already stained the hyaloid and you see a classic BRAO which has happened uh, alongside the foreign body in this situation. So, you could have so many different scenarios, but this is when you need to go in and and do an early uh, intervention uh, in these situations. For the patient slowly responded, the, the BRAO's edema cleared up and uh, a reasonably good vision was restored in the patient. Then of course, as we move ahead after the primary trauma, the other uh, concerns are the cataract which comes up, any if the high femur is not resolving, the pressure keeps going up, you may need interventions from uh, those aspects. And of course, you take the help of all the ancillary diagnostic tests and perception of light is a very important tool in deciding prognosis. So secondary repair is 7 to 14 days, 2 weeks, sometimes 3 weeks based on the inflammation that you see. And of course visibility is the key to any vitrectomy and you want the edema to come down uh, so that you could have good visibility. At this stage you go in and reassess the wounds of primary tear 
uh, to make sure that they are well reinforced. In case not, you need to reinforce them sometimes. Uh, you may have hostile media which needs clearing and then you assess uh, what has happened behind. So typically a non-clearing hemorrhage on the ultrasound, you see a hemorrhage which is not clearing in a blunt trauma. Uh, this is a classic scenario. Uh, you'll always see dense hemorrhages at times with no PVDs and, and they can be tricky uh, uh, to do the PVD creation. And then when you clear it, you may see a choroidal tear behind so the prognosis would be always uh, variable, and at times you may have a very good LV macula behind and the patient may get back good vision. Another situation where you do an ultrasound and you see uh, a detachment behind the, uh, the hemorrhage, and so you may have a situation like this, and uh, you have an impact site also, uh, which is seen here, uh, along with the, uh, the hemorrhage, which is cleared, and so you will need to then go and assess and again the prognosis is poor because the impact is uh, all around the macular area. Then a giant retinal tear may come up or a giant dialysis may come up at times uh, which may require intervention. The classic dialysis you may, where the flaps are not folded, you may get away with buckling but a classic large tear would require a, a full intervention to uh, repair. So, so these are situations which will come up in due course uh, of follow up at times, it may not happen instantly, but uh, it's uh, not uncommon to see these uh, situations come up uh, in cases uh, where this will happen. Then a macular hole is not uncommon again. You may have choroidal tears, pigmentary alterations, and then a hole which has come up. And in the past, we used to think that these holes are not, don't respond the same way as uh, the, the regular variety of macular holes that we see, and we used to, uh, keep them conservative, but uh, nowadays we know that if we intervene early in these cases, they, they do tend to do well. Uh, you have to do the same things that you do for a regular macular hole surgery, uh, remove the ILM and then they close quite well if you have intervened in time. But of course you wait uh, at least a month or so because at times there is spontaneous closure also noted uh, in these cases. Dialysis, as I told you, with holes is again common in the blunt traumas in cases, and, and this is uh, buckling being done, uh, chandelier based buckling, a quick view to see uh, uh, localized on the cryo of the prom, and then you see the buckle effect inside, uh, and they do quite well with the, this kind of an approach. Uh, quick case to show you that at times you have these uh, extensive wounds where you have lens which has come out in the sub. Uh, conjunctival space and there's choroidals behind uh, and these kind of situations can be messy and uh, you clear up as much as you can and at times where there's extensive subretinal bleeding and we, I like to put, uh, this is draining the choroidals uh, the, from, with the blood which is coming out and these are cases where once you remove PFCL it tends to come back at times. So we try to leave PFCL in such cases for a few weeks, let the edema settle down, and, and then uh, uh, you go back in. And that time you'll always see a much uh, a quieter eye, a healthier eye. This is after 20 days that you go back in. So these are situations, I think, where we probably have to do a two-step approach and then replace it. Well. So these are some of the situations that I showed you in relation to an open or a closed globe and, and some sort of a primary repair and a secondary repair timing and uh, the cases which don't require an emergency intervention, uh, different situations that fit into this category. Thank you very much. Excellent toxin. I'll pass the mic to the vice counsel. Dr. Mahesh, I was just wondering, what is your uh, take on the timing of surgery? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, uh, the, the second stage management is extremely important in trauma. The initial one is to an, uh, restore the anatomy. Second stage is to improve the vision. So this, usually, uh, the problems uh, where we need early intervention is when there is an IOFD or when we are suspecting early end of thalamitis, then this two-week waiting may not work. So to immediately, uh, I, next day itself, usually we do a scan next day after the primary repair. We find the IOFB just being removed immediately because chance of infection can set in very early. The vitreous hemorrhage and other things probably after two weeks. So, and uh, these things have a lot of medical legal implications. In fact, a lot of uh, consumer cases, everything is coming after trauma because of this. We send the patient and after three days, the patient comes with uh, dope or anything. 
So this timing for early prevention has to be there in uh, endocrine medicine. Uh, I tend to agree with mostly with what, what Manish said. Nice talk, Manish. But uh, most of the studies over the years, including the one seminal study by Professor Kuhn, uh, pointed highlighted that uh, the best principle to follow is that depending upon the experience of the surgeon. Surgeon is inexperienced, then it can be a two-stage defect. Because two things which come in the way in uh, for traumatic cases are effective creation of a PPD, and second is to control the bleeding. It is surgeons can in a primary situation for both these things is very effective, but inexperienced surgeons are on the side of stage defect. Yes, I'm sure it is customized and I think one has to look at prognostic aspects and then the expertise which would be required, yes. Because as I said, these traumatic hemorrhages can be quite difficult to create the PVD creation and sometimes to identify whether it's a retina or a thick hyaloid itself is at times difficult in these cases. Okay, Michael, I have a question. Cases of post-traumatic endophthalmitis, where the view is very hazy and generally they are polymicrobial in nature and very fulminant. So, <laughs> what extent of vitrectomy are you comfortable with? Just a core vitrectomy, a complete vitrectomy, or the use of tamponade, like silicone oil in these cases? So, I, I do as much vitrectomy as I'm comfortable with. And I, I certainly don't go into the case believing I have to actually get down to the retina and get all the tissue off because I really need to be sure I'm not going to create a retinal tear uh, or atrogenic roll. So I, I like to get as much out as possible, do the antibiotics, generally don't do silicone oil primarily unless I think it's a problem potentially of retinal detachment, um, but uh, do no harm, so be careful not to get to the retina. Uh, if, if I may, I just want to follow up with Dr. Manish, very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Um, for the secondary repair of penetrating injury, I completely agree with you. Seven to 14 days is what I generally do. It allows the eye and the inflammation to settle down, gives you better clarity, allows the wounds to seal, and decreases the risk of post-operative hemorrhage. Uh, a couple things to emphasize. One is, you mentioned B-scan, but for those, for those eyes that we don't have a view, and quite frankly, for penetrating trauma, we do a secondary repair most of the time, we don't have a view. Be sure to do a B scan ahead of time. And one, you want to know if it's a retinal detachment, although that's actually the second reason to do it. The first reason is you don't want to have a suprachoroidal detachment, a suprachoroidal hemorrhage that you inadvertently get into with your infusion. So be sure of that. Yeah. When you do the surgery, go top down. Start to clear out the anterior chamber, do lensectomy as needed, vitreous on the way down. One of the things that I've been impressed with over the years, the number of eyes who have difficult detachments or trauma and end up with silicone oil, gets into the anterior chamber, corneal decompensation, and you end up with an eye that's going downhill because of multiple pathologies. So more and more when possible, I like to maintain the integrity of either the anterior or posterior capsule to keep silicone oil back if I think I'm gonna to need to put it in. General, if you have the posterior capsule intact, uh, these are post-inflammatory eyes. Uh, a lot of there's a lot of addition between the iris and the capsule in the later stages. Difficult to put an aisle after that. Uh, it can be, uh, but even if you put it in sulcus, what you end up doing is you end up maintaining a barrier, and so much of the time you can break any sneak as needed. So I, I think it's worth a try. Uh, what about uh, uh, intraocular foreign body with uh, end of thalmitis? Sometimes the view is very poor and the foreign body is impacted with the ciliary zone and a lot of indentation can create a break. So do you uh, consider a second surgery to remove the IOB or you try, you know, trimming the cut? No, like the cornea is clear. I think the media is, doesn't matter, we can always make it clear, number one. And number two, I think uh, if it is somewhere in the past plan, fluid direction is very move up to, or sometimes zone moves, I think. You can always, and uh, the intraocular uh, rather the magnets are there. Go inside and you can always find it. Uh, it's not that difficult to find a problem. How about non-magnetic? Non-magnetic, if it is a stone or glass, just leave it. Only the vitreous cavity embedded. Especially glass, you don't have the appropriate, uh, what you call the forces. 
don't intervene. Just leave the blast. The patient is not going to, unless the patient has got erythromatitis. I mean, a quick uh, add on to the view issue. If, suppose it's a permanent infection involving corneal clarity today. We are also able to do temporary keratoprosthesis and, and, you know, try to get a view. So that is one option there in such situations. Rao, any quick comments? Uh, experience about endoscopic surgeries in, uh, with the cornea is easy and you need to remove. Uh, I've, or... I've used it in the past uh, when I had it uh, for a demo for a few months, a long time back, a 23 gauge endoscope. Uh, uh, and I've used it for a foreign body also. So I think it is useful and uh, uh, the best person would be Vivek. I think he's here. He has a lot of experience with endoscopy uh, for such cases. So do you like to add? Yeah, thanks, Vishal. I think uh, Talking about uh, intraocular foreign bodies, uh, always trying to make an attempt to remove them, especially if they are metallic and uh, vegetative. In situations where the cornea is you hazy, in situations where cornea is hazy, a temporary K-Pro or endoscopy is an option. In my hands, over the years, I have felt that uh, many a times, if there is no active infiltrate in the cornea, the corneal haze is often temporary. And if you can retrieve uh, the endos uh, the foreign body via an endoscope, you give the cornea a natural opportunity to clear out and you need not uh, do a keratoplasty going ahead. Just one small uh, <clears throat> foreign body, wherever they are lost money, one has to attempt to remove it. Yes. So one, and yes. one small point regarding suspected fungal endophthalmitis cases, because there are a lot of talk of epithelmitis with foreign body. Uh, the concentration of the fungal agents previously used, that is the area of concern, still don't know. I think antibiotics are safer, but suspected fungal, very careful about the concentration yeah. in the pericilicon state. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now I invite Dr. Shinivar Joshi on his talk on the advancements in ILM peeling and macular hole surgery. Uh, very good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the uh, entire BRSI team, especially Dr. Mahesh Mugam sir, uh, for this opportunity. So I'll be speaking on the newer things in ILM peeling and the second topic is the macular bone which is given to me. So the two most important things which I would like to say in doing ILM peeling is how you see it and second most important thing is how we do it. So the new introduction of the shark skin forceps by Alcon to provide the increased surgical precision to enhance the retinal surgery. So you can see this sharp micro ablated, I'll be coming into it later. It's with a revolution handle, it's called as a shark skin forceps. So this has this texturized uh, tip surface, as you can see here. And the second important thing is the larger grasping platform, so that you can hold these ILM, the, the fragile ILMs very well. So now I'll go through the videos. The laser ablated microsurface that increases the friction between the tissue and the forceps to improve the grip of the ILM peeling during ILM peeling. So now you can see here, I'm just trying to initiate my peel, but uh, because of that friction, I get the bulge of the ILM and that helps me in picking up. And again, thanks to these uh, visual visualization system, you can use different color channels. I'm more comfortable with monochrome as you can see here, but so you see the disadvantage is these small petechial hemorrhages get masked sometime. Uh, so you cannot visualize it. So it's always better to go with the off mode and then uh, recheck it. So large grasping platform, how does it help? It helps to minimize the membrane shredding that can be caused by the multiple grasping attempts. So as you can see here, I'm just again initiating my peel uh, with the, the shark skin forceps. And uh, to be very frank with you all, I was uh, earlier very hesitant to use this forceps because of that broad uh, revolution handle. But later on, once I started using that, I could see that the, the, the shredding of these ILM is very minimal as compared to the other forceps. And uh, the multiple grasp attempts, you, you can try to get these ILM in a, uh, most of the time in the single sheet uh, rather than doing uh, multiple attempts. So that helps in minimizing. The, the trauma and accidentally even picking up uh, the retina. So you can see here, it's a very minimized trauma. Of course, uh, the sand fill and the dawn fill kind of features has to be noticed. And we are looking that uh, very soon 
in many of these cases. So now you can see this animated video of the shark skin. So the microstructured forceps surface increases the coefficient of the friction between the tissue. Although I cannot give a lateral view, but I can show here in the magnified view that the bunch of the, the ILM already comes up. I'm sure you're able to uh, notify that because in, intraoperatively it's very difficult to give a lateral view here, but definitely it helps in that. So more easily uh, grasping and peeling the ILM and minimize trauma to the retina in the process of the peeling. That are the advantages. So many more channels. So the next topic is about the macular holes. So you can see here, so I, I first try to do as much as minimal invasive. These are the failed macular holes. Uh, so here I do what a technique called as the macular detachment induction. So I, I tried to picking up this from Dr. Rajiv Muni from St. Mike's Hospital from uh, Toronto. So here you can see I'm using a 38 gauge needle and trying to uh, create a blister in the superior, inferior and the temporal quadrant here. And uh, once you try to uh, uh, enlarge the retina or detach the retina, then doing a fluid air exchange uh, and make sure that, that there is a 360 degree complete, you know, kind of uh, the, what the addition was there, it comes off and that the redundancy helps in closing. And this is the pre and the post stop. Uh, uh, of this picture in macular detachment induction. So coming to the next, uh, uh, what we do in case of failed ILM, the next we can, uh, oh, sorry, is uh, the ILM transplants. So I think that is not a very difficult procedure. Uh, uh, all of us can do it in case of failed macular hole. Now you can see here, I'm just using the IOCT. So here what I, I do is I use a viscoat and I try to put it inside the macular hole. You, you can see uh, so that uh, I have the ILM uh, to be stuffed or sitting in the place in the macular hole. All care should be taken that we should not touch the RPE, otherwise uh, doing any of these exercises will be futile. So again, I thought that this was a slightly larger hole, so I could even get a little uh, a good ILM. So getting a one good sheet of ILM is the key here. Even you can do it under PFCL also, you can just drag it, that is another easier technique uh, which we can do to uh, make these free flaps of the ILM stay inside this. So again, the IOCT showing fluid air exchange. And now you can see the pre and the post-op vision and surprisingly, I could see 6-9 vision. So I've done around 5-6 cases of these and they are doing pretty good. So my last case is uh, on the, if any, everything fails, this is the only way left for me is to do uh, a neurosensory graft technique. So here I use a 38 gauge needle and try to create a blister. And then uh, bimanually or even single-handedly also, you can try to uh, create, cut this uh, autologous or the uh, retinal graft and try to place it. Either you can slide it under the PFCL or you can just put it and then place it, uh, 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 fill the PFO above that. And again, a good placing, uh, uh, getting a good size of that is important here in the IOCT. You can see uh, how nicely it is sitting over the macular hole. Doing a fluid air exchange, I did a silicon oil in this case and uh, surprisingly the patient improved from 3 by 60 to 6 by 36 uh, vision in this case. So the various others are uh, uh, available in the literature and uh, thank you very much for the, the patient listening and the opportunity once again. Thank you. Thank you Srinivas and a quick comment from Dr. Michael sir. Uh, your experience about the shark skin forceps and any advantages over the routine ILM forceps in the peeling part? ILM. Yeah, so I, I've not seen the shark in forceps. I like the idea. Uh, I use the ILM forceps exclusively for these and generally fairly really happy. Uh, and contradistinction, I'll use serrated forceps for PDR cases. So I've got both and I use them based on, on indication. Uh, I, I like the idea of the shark skin of grasping and being able to pull up and not have any slippage. Uh, in a related manner, you, you mentioned trying to get everything done in one fell swoop, one peel all the way around, one grass, hopefully. I will tell people anecdotally that the unhappiest patient I ever had was a very successful macular hole surgery who I touched the, R I touched the RPE through the retina out near the arcade and he had a peripheral scotoma that he would not let me forget, uh, even though the visual acuity was 20-25. So doing things once was great. You do things 10 times, and you multiply the chances of creating an error. Give us two quick comments. Uh, three flaps. Better to do it under the PFC. Yeah, yeah. that's what I think. Otherwise, yeah, both, both the techniques are pretty good. Doing it under the PFO is, uh, is also more easier. Yeah. 
Please go to go back again to the plan. Second, that's a very good thing. So you can start up And from these sites, they're quite good. They're always sites. Okay. Also, PPR. Yeah. So, better idea is the 41 gauge initially and then add them. That will be the Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much. I now invite Dr. Himan Moti for his talk on closed funnel to leave or to attempt. Factors deciding the same. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank Dr. Mahesh and uh, Dr. Divyansh for this opportunity. I'll be speaking to you on trauma close from an RD to leave or attempt. Time is essential, is the essence. And uh, if you have a close from an RD, you actually miss the opportunity to achieve a successful result. Now we decided based on whether to attempt or leave is based on the nature of injury, whether it's open globe or closed globe, as mentioned by Dr. Manish. The extent of injury because of the injuries are generally, uh, we have coexistent with the injury to the cornea lens angle and the macula. In the closed globe injury, uh, they generally behave as regmatogenous detachments because they have uh, large tears or chain breaks. So they behave differently. However, in open globe injuries, because of the extensive fibrosis that it induces, if you delay the surgery, the prognosis is very poor. And you look for the history of when the primary repair was done or whether, whether it was done successfully. But if there is a foreign body of endophthalmitis, I think as was stressed, we need to do an early surgery. And you always look for light perception. In a study done on pediatric detachments, it was found that majority of them, about only 26% achieved 2200 or better. And they are further complicated by congenital anomalies. And you always look for the status of the other eye to decide whether to operate or not. So in the initial examination, sorry. Yeah, if you have observed that the patient has less than perception of light, do a B scan, and that's a typical appearance of an optic nerve avulsion, and uh, as seen on the photograph. And if you have a low IOP, suspect skull rupture, and generally most of the patients present with hemorrhage, so there is no view, so you need to do imaging. If you see a retinal detachment like this, you know that the prognosis is very poor because there are already a lot of damage to the retina with cyst formation. I, or a very stiff looking retina, you know that the prognosis is going to be poor, it's best left alone. Or a very disorganized globe, you probably would be better to leave it alone. Now, this is another patient of retinal detachment. You would see a very hyper reflective uh, echoes in the subretinal space. So, you will see the retina as an ecolucent space. So, if you see a picture like that, don't think that is hemorrhage. It's actually a retinal detachment long standing. So, best left alone. Or if there is occult rupture, you would probably feel some of these, the lower two panels show a occult rupture. So you always look for that before you attempt any surgery. And as mentioned previously, if there is a uh, suprachoroidal hemorrhage, you do a B scan, find out if there's suprachoroidal hemorrhage before you start the vitrectomy. Now in closed globe injury, because there are large tears, the best time is to treat them initially. So you always examine the patient. If you find large tears like this, do laser, or if there's a large GRT, operate it as early as possible because these would otherwise end up with very poor result. Now, this is a patient whom I did a surgery. He had large, two large radial tears that is coming, and I could achieve a successful result primarily because of the early intervention. In open globe injuries, we know that there is a fibrovascular ingrowth, so the best time to intervene is between 7 to 14 days. This is how the ingrowth occurs. You can see that there is a fibrous band that goes in and cause a tractional detachment. Now that produces a very poor prognosis. So the reason why we delay it is that the risk of bleeding is less and uh, the, we allow the healing of this sclera to occur and also the spontaneous PVD. This is on patient who presented to us with uh, an open globe injury and primary repair was done elsewhere at the limbus. And when I did a B scan, I thought there is a choroidal detachment, as you can see. 
and there appeared to be what was a small area where you can see hyperreflective echoes. I said I warned him that is possibly a close in LRD, and that is what it turned out to be. So as you proceed, I started the surgery as was discussed earlier from the anterior and used the AC maintainer primarily to help me because I saw the choroidal detachment. The entire surgery I did with the AC maintainer and with bimanual dissection, I was able to put the retina back and left the PFCL to go on for the second surgery. And this is the result after the surgery. So one has to be aware that these are problems that you would have. This is another child who had endophthalmitis. Because they present early, they with a penetrating trauma in the inferior quadrant, I had to do a retinectomy and get this flattened. And this is the result. So in conclusion, although we have good results uh, in vitreoretal, with the vitreoretal surgery in trauma, I think the timing of surgery is most important. And you should always look forward to preventing a closed funnel detachment because once they occur, the chances of getting any good visual result is poor. So the decision would depend on the type of injury, the time since injury, and the presenting vision. B-scan can help you in the decision process, but uh, always be ready for surprises. Thank you. I want to ask you to Naresh, if a child comes with a traumatic uh, retinal detachment, and he is you know, telling you PL negative, and that might not be very accurate according to the risk of it. Right. Do you operate such cases? Yes. To give a chance. Yes. Well, negative is not a contraindication, especially in trauma. Because we have seen, I think every one of us would have seen who have operated uh, the patients requiring the vision number one. Number two, unless otherwise it's a clear cut case of optic nerve avulsion, total avulsion, I think there is no nothing harm in explaining and giving them a, a chance with surgery. Optic nerve avulsion case? No, not in optic nerve. If it is uh, there, I think uh, it's gone. Otherwise, I think it's better to give it. It's not challenging in terms of your, the hyaloid separation because uh, it's incomplete, the traumatic, the choroid is thickened. So what are your tips for that? I keep telling, you know, we in this EFCL under which we stain with uh, transferone or blue, then we stroke it with uh, what you call uh, tannos. Once if you do that with tannos, then it forms like a membrane, then you can pick it with a membrane. And uh, when you pick the PFCL seeps under, and that also helps in... Uh, for the uh, detachment of the vitreous. So it's uh, not that difficult on this. By Dr. Singhit, for his talk on uh, intraocular foreign bodies, sub and trans retinal. Take it or leave it. We put some presentation. We have a uh, you know, question from the audience how to avoid sub retinal migration of PSL in case of radial tears. Yes, the only way. First, keep all the possible directions all around and then in the clips. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Vishal. So, my uh, talk for today is uh, about transretinal intraocular foreign bodies. Take it or leave it. And the answer is uh, I will always take it, except if the foreign body has crossed the sclera and is either extraocular or in the sclera, and if there is no perception of light, and some inert foreign bodies like gold or silver, you can uh, sometimes leave it, especially if you feel that you are going to cause more damage during the removal uh, than it is present now. So why we have to take them out? Uh, because most of the metallic foreign bodies, they lead to metal losses like sidrosis or chalcosis. They may lead to uh, late onset retinal detachment, uh, epiretinal membrane formation and PVR, and endophthalmitis. And then if you decide to take them later, there would be encapsulation of foreign bodies and then the removal will become difficult. So I'll just uh, present a few cases uh, of how I do it. So this is the first case. So this was a foreign body which was impacted into the retina. Uh, you have to do a vitrectomy first. And then you separate, uh, you do induce a PVD, then you take the foreign body out of this space and clear the media. Uh, I prefer to do a choreoretinectomy around the impact site. Uh, so you give deep 100% diathermy burns around this area. And then you uh, do a complete choroid removal up to the level of bare sclera. In this, in, in this area. This prevents uh, the late formation of or the post-op formation of 
epidermal membranes from this uh, impacted site and also takes care of all uh, incarcerations which has happened in this area. So after you have done this, I create a sclerotomy around 3.5 millimeters away from the limbus, so 2.5 millimeter. I lift the front body with active suction, transfer it to the front body forceps and then remove those through this sclerotomy. Then I suture the sclerotomy and then give a tamponade as is needed uh, in that particular case. So I, I usually give one to two rows of laser around this uh, chorioretinectomy sign. So this is post-operative. The patient had a good visual recovery of six by six uh, in, in this eye. This is another case in which uh, the front body was again, uh, this was a wire which, which had its two ends which were subretinal. Uh, actually, they were stuck, in fact, in the, into the choroid itself. So see, I tried to pull this front body out, but it was not coming. It was so impacted. So again, I started doing a chorioretinectomy at this point. I tried to free this uh, uh, wire from the subretinal tissue, which was binding this up. But I was not successful at this end, but I, then I tried the other end. And uh, from this, I was able to separate this foreign body from the subretinal tissue. And then I was able to pull this uh, foreign body out. And this patient also had a cataract, uh, so had done a cataract uh, lensectomy earlier. And I removed this foreign body through the sclerocorneal tunnel, which I had created earlier. And then uh, put an intraocular lens in the circle. And then this lens was uh, dialed into its place and was the optic was captured below the posterior capsule. So this was how it was done. And this is post-operative again, uh, because the macula was normal, the patient had a good vision of six by six post-operative. And this is my last case, 24 years, 24 years male, hammer and chisel injury. Again, there was a uh, front body with uh, perforating eye injury and Yeah, so there was a thick anterior posterior fibrous band here and uh, what I did was like first we separated the band from all its uh, vitreous adhesions, then do, did a complete vitreous based shaving. I was not able to locate the front body inside the eye, so it has gone subretinal, maybe it was lying under this band. So again, did a chororetinectomy again, this was nasal to the optic nerve. So once we completed the removal of choroid using this cutter, uh, I was able to locate the foreign body which was in the suprachoroidal space. So uh, this chorioretinectomy takes care of all this incarcerated tissue which was there. And, uh, and you see this is the foreign body in the suprachoroidal space. It was separated. And and then it was again removed through this extra sclerotomy which was created. It was lifted using active suction and then transferred to the front body forceps and then was removed through this sclerotomy. In this case, I had to use a, a silicon oil tamponade uh, post-op because I thought I had created a very large this chorioretinectomy just near to the optic disc. The patient, uh, in fact, had again a good visual recovery. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Excellent talk. So, Michael, your views on uh, extensive uh, chorioretinectomy. Uh, are you an aggressive surgeon? Are you hell bent on that foreign body and doing that uh, removal of the choroid? So, so, for an acute foreign body, I think yes. I, I think you should, and if it requires a chorioretinectomy, I think that's the way to go. And, and clearly, we have examples here where it works well. Uh, Dr. Mahesh has a beautiful uh, YouTube uh, video online showing you exactly how to do it as well for anybody who wants to go and look after the fact. Um, the, the only other thing I would, I would qualify, and, and I agree with you that pretty much all foreign bodies should come out. So if you see them primarily or get one referred to you soon, I think that's the surgical plan that's most appropriate. The question I bring up is, what if you see the patient six months later, or six months later, or a year later? Yeah. You know, do those foreign bodies need to come out? Well, one, we know it's not an endophthalmitis issue. Two, chances are in a year, whatever fibrosis were going to have happened likely would have happened by now. 
So three, the thing we're worried about is long-term fatalotoxicity for the retina. And if the vision is reasonably good and the foreign body looks rather inert, a lot of people would advocate following them, particularly with ERGs, and look for any evidence of retinal damage, otherwise leaving the foreign body alone. Yes. I guess you were lucky that uh, most of the cases were nasal to the optic disc. Yeah. But if you the foreign body was in the macular area, what would have? Yeah, I would have the uh, same procedure I would have done. Uh, Even if it was involving the fovea. Tengu Lozdek mm -hmm. has a, quite a series on uh, does pruritectomies even for the macular exit wounds. Because in some people have to leave it. What are your views? Mine? Yeah. So I, I will do I will do the same procedure. So even if it is the font body is involving the fovea, I will do the same. Because are you in favor of late pruritectomy? So late uh, late as uh, as Dr. Stewart has said, like uh, if the patient comes six months, one year later, and there's an encapsulated font body, I think we can observe them, and we can follow them by serial ERGs. And only if the ERGs uh, show a deterioration, we can plan for our research. Can you really modify the optic disc because the idea is to create a barrier? Yeah, yes. So if if the font body, if, if it's very large incarceration, what you can do is you can create a one to two millimeter strip of uh, bare sclera uh, in the area uh, around the incarceration site. I think that also works very well. So I have not shown those cases actually because of the lack of time. The technique of pyrrhythmia. Uh, first is how do you stop the oozing of the blood? Yeah, the oozing of blood do happens when you are removing the choroid, but uh, it's very easy to control by raising the infusion pressure. Or you can do a diathermy at that point. Uh, if there is a continuous ooze, you can do a diathermy. In fact, when you are removing the uh, choroid, uh, some, many a times I do it with the uh, diathermy uh, probe, probe only that you just melt off the sclera with the diathermy probe. Sorry, melt off the choroid. You make sure that all the RP is removed because that is the site of yes, the proliferation. Yes, yes. In fact, the whole of the choroid is gone. When your video was that you lasered it after the removal of the foreign body. Yeah. Why don't you the other way around? So everything laser it and then foreign body yeah, is done. Actually, what Dr. Ferenc, Dr. Ferenc Kuhn advocates is there's no need for laser. Just put, put a layer of extra protection around that. Uh, he says that there is no need for laser even. You don't need laser. Yes. What he says, but I just feel a bit more protected myself, just putting two, two rows of laser. Yeah, I would say your diathermy itself acts as a pretty good adhesive post operatively as well. You know, like uh, most of these cases which we are seeing are isolated ocular foreign bodies. But I think in a general hospital, we get with a lot of collateral damage, the bits and annex, and most of those cases, uh, they don't come to us. Another thing which we come across is cirrhosis. Like we get a lot of cases, and uh, in the case with cirrhosis comes through ERG, even if the ERG is flat, do an EOG, the presence of a flat ERG and a flat EOG is of no use in removing. But the patient is having flat ERG, but the EOG is still good. Still, we go ahead and uh, we can give a chance. Only thing is, the post of inflammation is very high, severe in those cases. Dr. Vishal, I have a uh, take on the type of instrument in taking out the foreign body. The rare earth magnet, use the basket passage like a magnetic, whatever it is, because what my things in together. Our body was three years, relatively simple, like this, as before. So, uh, Papa's forceps is my favorite instrument, removing non-magnetic, uh, non-magnetic. So, why is the technique that you have? Yeah. I have a question about the choreoretic. Earlier, we were not doing this, and it's not also every patient recurred with a TRD. So, now, are you 100% sure that like a choreoretectomy doesn't cause the recurrence? I, it has in my case. I have done a choreoretectomy around the proliferation despite which I have had recurrences. So are we putting too much of emphasis on the choreoretectomy, particularly when Sangeet says when it's at the back, I will create a choreoretectomy around that. So nasally it's fine, but like uh, the amount of nerve fibers going from the macula towards the disc, 
and into destroying a large amount of it and the visual field can be affected if you're doing a photo retinectomy at the macula. I would want the panel to like uh, give your comments on that. Oh, I agree or, with that. If you were to put it the other way around, do you do a photo retinectomy in every case, the panel? No, no, no. I don't do the macula one. That's why I specifically put the question to Sangeet. Because there are people who does it, I mean, including yourself, does macula, but I don't do. So I, I, I think I'll cover it in my second talk, which is just after. No, let's finish this now before we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so so I, 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 do not, I do not primarily, unless there's no other way I get the foreign body out. But if I can remove it and control the bleeding, then that's my first procedure. And then I'll go back if I have significant in, ingrowth uh, or fibrosis that can't be controlled. Harish? I don't do it always. It's only for selected cases. But Many a times it is lying on the retina. There is no need to even do anything. No laser, nothing. Just remove and leave it. Dr. Sangeet, you can continue with your second talk. The potential retinectomy for deep impacted ocular trauma in India. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vishal. So, uh, chorioretinectomy was first introduced by Zivozinovic in 1987. Uh, as a therapeutic procedure, but as a prophylactic procedure, it was uh, popularized by Dr. Ferenc Kuhn in uh, 2004. It is done in deep impact ocular trauma with vitreous incarceration or choroid penetration, and it reduces the RPE proliferation, fibrous ingrowth, and PBR from the wound site. As I detailed earlier, it can be done as a prophylactic or a therapeutic procedure. So this, uh, to understand the concept of chorioretinectomy, I just present this case. So this was a patient of perforating eye injury, a double perforation with endophthalmitis and foreign body which has crossed the uh, posterior sclera. So after re uh, repairing the wound, we did a vitrectomy and then after vitreous removal, we saw this exit wound which was just present in inferior temporal uh, thing. And because of endophthalmitis, did not do anything at that time. But later on, you see there was a fibrous ingrowth from the exit wound and it covered the macula. The vision was not good. So we went in again, we did a removal of the ERM, we did a choroidectomy. We had to spare these large vessels because if you uh, try to occlude them, they will cause a branch retinal vein occlusion. So I'm doing a choroidectomy here. Uh, I'm just trying to melt the choroid with the diathermy, but it was not coming. So use the cutter to remove whatever tissue was left uh, of this choroid. You see, we have to do it up to the level of Bayer's sclera in this eye taking care that you are not injuring the major blood vessels. So again, uh, so I did this. Uh, any bleeding was controlled with the diathermy or uh, by raising the infusion pressure. Just give one to two rows of layer, uh, laser around this choroidectomy site and then did a fluid air exchange. And I put gas in this. This was actually my first case which I had done a choroidectomy. So this patient uh, post-operatively uh, had no recurrence uh, till two months and the best corrected vision improved to 6 by 18. This is one year post-op again. There was no recurrence of fibrous in growth. So we thought like we evaluated, we did a re retrospective study to evaluate the success and limitations of performing prophylactic choroidectinectomy in Indian eyes. And it was a retrospective case series. 11 eyes of penetrating eye injury with or without foreign body. Uh, were included, which is in, was incarcerated in posterior retina. Visual equity was more than accurate PR. Uh, either a 25 or a 27 gauge PPV with wide angle non contact viewing system was done. Uh, the general procedure consisted of vitreous base excision, foreign body removal, choreoretinectomy, ando laser, and gas or silicon oil tamponade or air tamponade as was needed in th that case. So the uh, deep endodiathermy burns, 100% uh, deep diathermy burns were given around the incarceration site. And then the removal of incarcerated retinal tissue with underlying choroid was done to the level of Bayer's sclera. One to two rows of prophylactic laser were done around the site. And any bleeding was controlled by diathermy or increasing the infusion pressure. So they, all, all patients were male patients, the average age, they were young males. And uh, intraocular foreign body was inside the globe, uh, impacted in the posterior wall in seven of these eyes. There was an exit wound in two eyes. There was a knife injury uh, causing vitreous incarceration in one eye and cow's horn injury in one eye. And uh, there was retinal detachment associated with the injury in four eyes, and ophthalmitis in one eye, significant vitreous hemorrhage in four eyes, and subretinal hemorrhage in two eyes. The surgical steps, silicon oil was used in five of these eyes, and gas tamponade was used in four of these eyes. 
So post-operative, we had a retinal attachment in all eyes. The recurrent PVR do, did occur in about uh, two eyes in about 18% of the cases. But there was visual equity improvement in 10 eyes and there was a BRVO which was affecting vision in uh, one eye. So these are some of those cases. This is a cow's horn injury who had a total vitreous hemorrhage, anterior incarceration, posterior incarceration, RD with subretinal hemorrhage. And this is the post-operative, uh, the vision had improved to 6 by 18. This is again a patient of double perforation and uh, we did a chorioretinectomy. The vision, this was again in the macular area and the vision improved to 6 by 9. This was a patient of impacted intraocular foreign body. Again, this is a supracoroidal intraocular foreign body with fibrosis, this case I showed earlier. Uh, this is the post-operative photograph and uh, this was a patient with a knife injury. He had a total retinal detachment with large vitreous incarceration and uh, he recovered a good vision of 6 by 36 post-operatively. So to conclude, chorioretinectomy still is a relatively new procedure. It has to be explored and it may prevent exit wound, exit side wound-related PBR and fibrous growth over the retina from the wound side and it may be considered as a prophylactic or a therapeutic option. Thank you. So, Sangeet, again a great talk, but uh, like Mahesh raised some concerns, so which has to be addressed. Can't run away from that. So, uh, I'm very comfortable in doing a choreotherapy advocacy in wounds which have a fair bit of margin away from the optic disc and away from the fovea. Yes, but uh, close to the optic disc and we, we are, I think, be more conservative in our approach. That's my take. I think uh, the macular uh, injuries, they cause more uh, proliferation of epiretinal membranes post-operatively if you lay them as such, rather than the wounds that are away from the optic disc. That, that this is my observation, I don't know. So at the risk of causing a lot of controversy, I'm going to ask a question because I'm surrounded by a lot of very experienced surgeons. Uh, as Dr. Mahesh said, especially for the ones that are fairly close to the disc, you end up with significant peripheral vision defects. And one of the ones that you did was a very nice result, but it probably resulted in a vertical hemianopsia yes. just because you're removing choroid and retina. Yeah. What if, or has anybody tried, and I've not seen this written, you did a large peripheral iridectomy, iridotomy. You folded the retina back. You then got the foreign body out from the, under the folded retina removing whatever choroid was necessary, put the retina back over top, you end up with a focal scotoma, but you maintain all of your peripheral vision beyond that. Has anybody done that? Because I've not seen it written, and you get much better visual field stability afterwards. I think for a detached you, you retina, there is a, there is a possibility, but for an attached retina, I, I don't think... We'll create a retinal detachment and remove the foreign body, creating a... You're talking of removing like subretinal scars, you do a 180 degree and you just fold it and... I just wanted to ask about the chorioretinectomy. I mean, the cases you showed of, say, a knife injury with or a cow horn and the incarcerations, and there, if you do it, uh, makes total sense. But I think you're trying to say that any foreign body that we remove, uh, you should do a chorioretinectomy so that maybe in the future there is no um, secondary issues with it. But not I don't many. think we One see it. Are... I mean, the issues with foreign bodies are so rare. I mean, if you remove it and a clean foreign body and do a laser around it, uh, nothing happens to those cases. So why would one consider doing it for all foreign body cases? No, not all foreign bodies, but one which have penetrated the choroid. Uh, in those cases, I would advocate them because uh, just removing them, I, what, I, my experience is not that good. Most of them land up with the recurrent PVR later on. No, with foreign bodies, if you clean up the whole vitreous and do a laser, even if they've penetrated, uh, it's very rare. So if it, suppose a complication happens and you have a detachment coming up from the site, uh, then maybe it's a good idea to go and do yeah, You a may do it as up, a secondary but, uh, procedure if you feel like doing it. That's also an option. Mm. Yes. Thank you for a nice uh, paper that has created a lot of discussion. I just had a doubt about a mic, one please. of your... It's working. I had a doubt about one of the photographs that you showed. Uh, you have done... 
you have done a choreorectinectomy almost at the major vascular arc just above the yes ma'am one would expect that some vascular change should have occurred anterior yeah temporary brvo did happen and one one patient just lost vision due to brvo that i mentioned yeah, because i look at the retinal vessels looking almost normal in that anterior to that so i just wanted to know what you expect yeah one one of those patients ma'am did did had a brvo and uh, the vision did not improve in that patient but uh, another patient had a brvo but later on uh, the hemorrhage resolved and the patient ha had regained a good vision and that was the patient that i uh, showed you the first the video which i showed you uh, that patient had a brvo it was one body was very the exit wound was very close to the vessel itself actually and uh, that patient had a post operative brvo but uh, uh, I I did not do it at the first sitting. I did at did the choroidectomy as a secondary procedure when there was a fibrous growth, and uh, that patient did uh, do did do well after uh, the choroidectomy. The BRVO uh, came down. The hemorrhages came down later on, and the patient is doing well uh, even after two years of follow up. He is maintaining a good vision of six by eighteen, and there is no recurrence of uh, PBR from the site. But one patient did had a. Uh, BRVO, which led to poor vision. I think uh, extending what Dr. Mona said, we recently had a case where we had to, uh, you know, laser that area. I did a subsequent angiogram in this case. So the artery, of the, the vessels were looking all open, but when I did an angiogram, it was not getting filled up. But in the late stages, it was looking normal. So I don't know what, so, I, so there was a large inferior area of capillary non-perfusion but uh, the patient is doing well. So uh, that's what I think you should probably go ahead and do an angio in these cases and see how these vessels behave. The question from the audience that, uh, what should be the approach in subretinal foreign body case close to the fovea uh, without a retinal detachment? And I extend the question to that, if that foreign body is not in the choroid, it's just protruding and you can easily tease it out with a forceps or a magnet, Will you still perform a choreoretinectomy? No, no. If if it is not in, uh, uh, impacted into the choroid, it's not gone deep. I think we should not do a choreoretinectomy at that. That is uh, that was I think Manish what Manish had asked. The audience. Thank you. I think we'll conclude uh, the trauma session. Thank you, Dr. Sangeet, for the Thank amazing you. talks. Thank you, all the panelists and the speakers for the insights on ocular trauma. Thank you so much.